I am not a mystery reader. Occasionally a, 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 a mystery um, uh, film, uh, TV show, uh, you know, of the Agatha Christie kind of uh, uh, thoughtful mystery. Um, maybe, maybe after. <laughs> <laughs> of change that Bill Schubert referred to in his talk yesterday. You know, how to balance out uh, the, the, the big publishers being your own publisher, uh, building a brand, uh, lot, lots of things that we have talked about, and Archer embodies them. And so I, we can all look forward to his remarks. And then, as he put it to me, that the rest of us will be completing the keynote by talking afterwards. So Archer, thank you for coming. Possibly the best introduction I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's trash, but... <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody's a critic. Um, I don't read murder mysteries either, to be perfectly honest. Um, but I do write them, and I wrote them, uh, or started writing them in 1975, because even then I was looking at this insane marketplace and this idiotic business we call publishing, which more resembles a bowl of spaghetti than it does any other working template I've ever set eyes on. Uh, and I thought to myself, well, let's see, the average income of a writer in the United States back then was about $8,000 a year. By the way, we're obviously mobile. I think it's nine five now. Uh, but uh, you know, how the hell do you want to make a living in this business if indeed your aspirations are $10,000 a year? <laughs> uh, so the first thing was murder mysteries, which are still rising with a bullet. Um, then it was uh, regional, then it was serial, then it was you know hero driven, and then blah 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 down the line. So basically, the idea was how could I write within this realm of literature and still look at myself in the mirror? Um, and that's where I came up with this figure of Joe Gunther, who comes out of Vermont and, and uh, who better be doing his job because I'm working on book number 25 uh, as we speak. Well, not exactly as we speak, but always I'm cranking away. Um, so, uh, my partner in crime, my my other half, my, my trusted advisor, Margo, who's sitting very low, <laughs> melting away, and I uh, were driving down here uh, in, of course, my um, Vermont licensed pickup truck, because I have standards. Um, <laughs> And uh, we were discussing all of this uh, and getting nowhere fast, uh, which is why, as Tortoise pointed out, uh, that I will sort of break the ice and introduce myself a little bit. But then what I want to do is to respond from the trenches I inhabit uh, to your questions. Am I failing at my cylinders in the class? Oh, I don't know what we're doing. Um, <laughs> point being that I came out of the Tundra just as a writer. I believed you know, all the, that there was a Knopf and there was a Random House and there was a Double A and that you know, was it. And, there were, and, and uh, the, the world was an uncomplicated and simple thing as I journeyed forth. Uh, as we are all, uh, in, in large extent, painfully aware, uh, things have changed. Late breaking memo. Uh, publishing is in the toilet, uh, but by the same token, while well, when Tortoise asked me what what should be the title of your talk, I don't even know. I haven't read your program. I have no idea. By one liner, got it into print. But I said uh, something about 
Um, that ain't no iceberg that's opportunity <laughs> because my agent had you know, sort of glumly written me uh, a while back about the publishing industry, and I said, well, it reminds me of a fleet of Titanics all circling the same iceberg. <laughs> um, indecision being their only saving grace at that point. <clears throat> In fact, I think there is opportunity to be done, but it, it, it is from a somewhat unorthodox angle. Um, and, those of you who suffered through my version of lunch just minutes ago have discovered I'm big on being unorthodox. Uh, all right, so now we fall back onto the introduction. Uh, I came out of the University of Texas Press where I was underemployed and frustrated and beginning to write on company time because they wouldn't let me do my job. And so revenge was sweet and I began to write murder mysteries in which all my bosses played roles as clubs. <laughs> Worked for me, and they were so all was well. In 1980, I decided I could be this stupid all by myself, and that was the last full-time job I ever enjoyed. It was actually 1979 with Lewis County, and I've been a contractor ever since. So I work typically uh, about five different jobs. Uh, some people know me only as a cop. Sorry about that. Uh, other people know me as a medical examiner. You would be sorry, but you're dead, so that doesn't count. And then you others know me as a writer. Well, that didn't last either because somewhere down the line, just after I had appeared in a, in a situation like this and bragged about the fact that my entire backlist, even though I was a mid-lister, was still in print, I got the memo from my publisher that they had taken 14 of my titles and ixnate them. Ooh, just like that. Thank you. So that then threw me into the mode of not getting mad again. Even uh, I stood back for the first time, looked up, and saw the world that these traditionalists were inhabiting. And what did I find? Well, I find that whatever world it was, they were not inhabiting it. Okay, they were in total denial and in total ignorance of the reality swirling around them. All of which began with the word E, as in electronic, because they were still insisting, for example, that any manuscript I produced on a computer needed to be printed out and <laughs> mailed to them, which I was dutifully doing. Okay. Memo to self, something not right is going on here. So I sent a very innocent sounding letter to them, letter, mark the word. Remember the last time you sent one of them? <laughs> and in the letter, it said, would you, since you barely know my name, remember I'm Arthur Major, the famous writer, <laughs> uh, send me back the rights to all the books you just uh, put on the shelf. And they sort of went, uh, well, we don't know who you are, but yeah, you can have all the rights back. So instantly, I repossessed for not a dime the 14 titles of my original books. That's <laughs> That's what I meant <laughs> by getting even. So I immediately embraced all the words that began with E, uh, and I became my own publisher, and now I'm my own E publisher. But herein lies the punch. Margo and I, now admit I'm cheating because there are two of me. She's the other me. Okay. And, all, and some of you guys, or some writers, don't have the advantage of being able to split and subdivide and multiply. But, you know, cloning is cool, too, and that's very trendy, so I clone. She's much better looking than me, so obviously the second model is an improvement, but you won't go there. Point being that it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy to do what I've done, so do, you know, whatever I mouth off here, just take that in stride. I... Uh, I've lost my train of thought. Hey, I was going to roll it. Your backlist. Cloning. Cloning. No. Your backlist. What you did with your backlist. Revenge. Your books. Oh, yeah, revenge. And initially I turned out my own uh, trade paperback operation Ampress, which is warehoused and distributed by Linda over there. The other thing was keep it local and eyeball the people with whom I work. Um, 
that was also useful and helpful to an old timer like me. However, the ebook stuff began to come in on board. And so you go, okay, this is going to go become relevant shortly. Ebooks. All right, what do I know about ebooks or publishing ebooks? Nothing. Okay, I'm a writer, uh, I'm a cop, I'm, I do stuff that ain't ebooks. So, of course, what you do, being old school, you will look up people who do ebook publishing and you hire them and they say, well, for this amount of money or whatnot, you know, we'll take the profits and we'll share them with you and whatnot. So if you begin to analyze that somewhat closely, you will discuss you will discover one of the great truths of publishing. And that is that the or, in other words, the manuscripts, have to be considered a volunteer effort. Writers, and this is a, that's how I entered the publishing world. I'm very sensitive to this. Writers are deemed to be volunteers. The basic process, the basic material on which we draw to be publishers, by and large, is considered free. So the big heavy hitters, of course, they, they make the investment of an advancing extra royalties. Those are beginning to disappear, by the way. Okay. Uh, so that the author has been presumed to be uh, independently wealthy, otherwise employed, married very well, has the last name of Rockefeller when he's the real last name instead of a pseudonym, stuff like that. Okay, uh, and therefore you can pay this guy the average income that I quoted earlier on of nine thousand bucks a year. Why can you get away with that? Because no author in his right or her right mind assumed that they could make a living. Why did they make that assumption? Because it was delivered to them by the powers that be, the publishers. Okay, so I began to look at all that, not ever having forgotten that early lesson when I went for an ebook publisher. And he, of course, said the same thing. Okay, well, of course we'll take it on, we'll turn it into ebooks, and we'll do all this neat and groovy stuff. Uh, I'm going to take my guaranteed cut of whatever it is, and you'll be left with whatever it is. You know? So you pay me. The upfront costs. I will turn your product into an ebook. So, in other words, his costs are immediately unaddressed. This is what we used to call in the old days vanity publishing. Remember when that was a dirty word? No longer. Now, anybody with any brains is going to go to the author and say, Well, okay, I'd be delighted to publish your book. Now, what do you want to put on the table? Well, in the old days, it was, Why well, put the goddamn manuscript on the table? Mm. What have you done lately? You know, where's your wallet? So this has become a very interesting form of communication. Well, so what did we do? We started with this ebook guy. We sort of saw what they were doing. Margo and I put our heads together and came up with the notion that, you know, we could actually do this. Guess who just got fired? The ebook publisher. So now we are our own ebook publisher. That's part of what's going on in this brand new world is that the veil has been torn off and the emperor has been discovered as wearing very scanty clothing. All right, we look at the guys, and I can say this from experience because my front end, that sort of sounds funny. <laughs> Anyhow, the more recent books are being published by Macmillan, who, of course, is owned by somebody else. And they, they, McMillan, they call themselves Minute or St. Martins or whatever they call themselves, but they are the front end New York publishers and they're nice guys. I'm getting along just fine with them. They do pay me in advance and they, they, they publish the hardback, okay, and that's great. But let's not kid ourselves. They know very little and I dance with them because they do pay me the advance and as soon as they sit down at that negotiating table and tell me well, remember the good old days? Wave bye bye. That's when I'm walking away. Because what are the front end publishers giving the likes of me? Well, if you listen to them, they're giving me the world on a sateen pillow. But if in fact you crunch the numbers and really look at it, eh, sateen ain't silk. Okay, it's mostly filled with hot air. They are <laughs> scrambling around, but their connections are drying up. Their reach is reducing in scope. They are losing their influence on a weekly basis. 
and when you stick uh, a, a, uh, a microphone under their nose and you ask them for their wit and wisdom, you get some of the father Chargo dug up literally on our drive here. I am not going to hold my source of information because it's so embarrassing I don't want word to get out where I got this clang track, but you will love some of this stuff. Uh, an agent was interviewed in this uh, article. This is a publication that's very high-end uh, and very well-known, so but I'll leave it at that. Uh, and so these guys went around and they talked to publishers and agents, the cutting edge, the big names, very glossy stuff, nice color photographs of these, these sages, one of whom said, work hard and write better books. <laughs> okay. No, good idea. Get right on that. Um, <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey was certainly a better book. <laughs> good, good picture. Uh, what's another one here? Oh, here's a good one. To be perfectly honest, zero dollars should go to a website. I get a lot of pushback on this. No kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. In other words, the grand old people of this business, they've got less and less to offer. Where does that bring me at the punchline before I open all this up to questions? It brings me to the point where I began, which was don't get mad, get even. In other words, go out there and start from scratch. There is little that has gone before that is going to be relevant now. This is a whole new ballgame. If wiser older heads say to you, well, it has always been so, stop right there. Because this is not based on precedent. <clears throat> this is the Wild West, and you know, it's up to us to invent what we need to do. Here's the problem though, is that you're going to get people like this telling you websites are bad, websites are good, you need to do this, you need to do that. Margo and I get assailed on a daily basis with really nifty ideas. And the endless debate between the two of us has got to be, what is the value of this? How does this feel on the inside? Because there's no data out there with any, of any worth. Okay, there's a lot of opinion. Everybody's got a great opinion. And people will even say, well, so-and-so did this with his book. Okay, Fifty Shades of Grey. So we're all going to dedicate ourselves to doing exactly what Fifty Shades of Grey did. No, we didn't write Fifty Shades of Grey. And even if we did write Fifty Shades, it's already been done once before. So that entire template is shattered. So whenever someone approaches me and gives me that kind of pitch, I have to look inside myself and simply ask the question, what does this feel like? What does it feel like to me with my acquired wisdom that I can sink my teeth into this and spend time, money, and energy trying it? Will I give my dedication to it as I deserve, not as it deserves? Or is it an idea that sounds, I don't know, I don't know yeah, I suppose I could try that. My sense is if that's how you filter this recommendation, don't do it. Because there are no rights, there are no wrongs. Can we talk to one another? That's what we're doing here. Good idea. But as soon as someone stands up and says, do it this way, be careful. Especially if there's a price tag involved, because that's where the worm is beginning to turn around. A lot of folks are charging for their expertise in one way or the other. Be careful of that. Unless, of course, you're cynical enough, perhaps like me, to turn that around and take advantage of that. P.T. Barnum was rarely wrong. There is a sucker born every year. And if you want to, in fact, take advantage of that, well, then you, too, can approach a huge population of writers, either extant or wannabe, and melt them for every cent that they're worth. Because sadly, the flip side of all this highfalutin chit-chat 
is that there are lots of people with disposable cash, of course their spouses may not think it's disposable cash, who are willing and able to spend lots of money on impossible to achieve dreams. So if you want to go that route, you can also turn it around and make that pitch because it's very much of a vibrant marketplace. If you are credible, and if you are deeply without heart, you can go out there and take these guys for a bath. <laughs> That's the sad reality. So our inner core, our sense of integrity and morality are going to have to be really held to the fire. Questions? Are you publishing only ebooks of the uh, backlist? No. I began uh, with uh, trade paperbacks. And I still publish trade paperbacks. In addition, when the ebook templates began to sort of, you know, make sense, then I jumped on with that, and now I publish ebooks as well. Uh, and the ambitions. That's the other thing is keep nimble and keep broad-minded. Am I looking at graphic? Yeah. Am I looking at audible? You bet. Am I looking at, uh, at you know, uh, three dimensions? Am I looking at holograms? Am I looking at anything that we are? I'm looking at all that stuff nonstop. But here's the other thing. Let me, let me, I, I was looking at one point at an audio project. And so immediately people said to me, oh, I like you go to audio.com. Or audible.com, or whatever the hell it's called. Like there's there's a mothership out there. There's the equivalent of Microsoft called whatever I just called it. Okay? And that's where you bring your audible thing. As soon as someone gives me a recommendation like that, I begin to get really hairy around the eyeballs because I am suspicious of putting all my work. I've been doing this now since 1975. Full time, 1980. I am ill disposed to spending that many decades of effort and going up to some mothership who's going to give me, you know, 30 percent uh, on the dollar uh, just because they're the biggest bear on the dam. I'm going to ask, what's the value I get out of this? And if you don't satisfy my inquiry, then I'm going to do it on my own, just like with the ebook thing. Uh, you piqued our curiosity, <clears throat> saying that you figured out a way of cloning yourself. Oh. Of cloning yourself. Yeah. And uh, I think many of us would like to find a way of coming up with authors that had your energy and that would spend a large part of the year flogging their book from one coast to the other. How do you do that? Is, is, is your uh, hard book publisher, Macmillan, uh, setting that all up? No, see, here's the problem is that, and this is actually kind of an interesting evolution. When, when my latest hard book publisher, with whom I've now danced through four or five hardbacks, something like that, um, McMillan of St. Martin said, I actually am one of the few guys around who has nice things to say about me. Why? Because, in part, uh, when they first married me, I said, uh, oh gosh, let's, uh, let's have a meeting. I'll come on down to New York City, uh, and you can put me up for one night in a hotel. They went, not likely. And I said, well, I'm going to come down anyhow, and we're going to have a meeting. Uh, you bring all your heavy hitters into uh, the meeting, and I'll have a list of uh, points of things that I think might be worthy of conversation, and tell me what you think about them. You could tell, my God, I might as well have vomited on their shoes. <laughs> you know, but hey, what are they going to do, right? So they held a meeting, and they sat me down. They insisted that my agent be there. My agent had nothing to say, except, of course, she was just really glamorizing in front of all of them, so she was totally useless <laughs> and filled up the air with chit chat and New York you know, bother. Uh, and then they threw smoke at me, and there were like 10 of them around the table, so we knew we were like a substitute lunch break. And, and I was left imitating a guppy with my 15-point my list. Lesson learned, right? So I began to get subversive. And as the years went on, 
I drilled out of them. Well, this didn't work. You didn't do that. I did that. And what I did is what brought them over. Because at my peak, <clears throat> over a two and a half month publication period, because all my books, the hardbacks always come out in the fall, as you painfully know. <laughs> you spent big money buying them, and I appreciate that. <laughs> but these books come out in the fall, and at my height of converting the publishers, I was making approximately 100 personal appearances over a two and a half month period. Okay? That's a little over the top, okay? I wouldn't expect that of your average author, but that's where the communication broke through. And they went, oh my God, he wasn't kidding. When he said to us, I'm the best salesman you'll never have to pay for. How do you get that out of your own authors? Good luck. But it is going to have to be a come to Jesus conversation where you might say to them, guys, we've got a variety of ways of going. I can mortgage my house and, and pay you in advance and publish your book because I'm that kind of guy. Okay, forget that one. Okay. The other one is, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, you need to put some money on the table and we'll do this together. Eh, some, some people do it, maybe you can work something out. The other thing is, sweat equity. Yeah, maybe you can put some money, but more importantly, you can put your body on the line, and we can coordinate and cooperate on effort. Okay, so you're shy and retire, you don't like to be an extrovert like me. I'm actually not, but I'm a show-off, so it helps. You do that. Well, maybe you put them in front of a computer, because they're nerds, and maybe they'll work the website, and you become a team. You coordinate. Now, maybe you get some secretarial assistant to do it rather than yourself, but that's your own problem is how to structure your organization so that you can then, because that's the other thing you've got to bring to the table, you have to bring a contact person. If you're going to enlist that author, then you have to make sure someone picks up those phone calls at 2 o'clock in the morning when the author's in tears and going, well, I don't want to get you out of my office. Now you're forcing me to be a salesman. You know, so there is a there is a symbiotic something that's got to go on there. Um, but that's what I suggest is the sort of love and nurturing. You know, the sad part is, is we have to sort of get over the fact that all of us are adults. We're not. We're all kids in disguise. You know, I'm still worried about and when is my zipper open? You know, that's why I'm standing in front of the podium. <laughs> Stuff like that. We all know that we're kids in disguise. You need to communicate with your authors that we love you, baby, you know, but you need to bring something to us as well. That's that's what I was just. It's obviously going to be on an author by author basis. You're going to have to figure it out. And we're also going to have to be tough to a certain extent. Is the property they're submitting good enough that we'll put up with their crap, insecurities or otherwise, or is in fact is it time to say, you know, Love you, don't love your work, you're not helping out, your product's not selling on itself, you're gone. And that's the other thing is we all need to toughen up a little bit. It's, it's a hard world. And the nurturing that went on with Maxwell Perkins back in the old days, you know, when you got a crate of 6,000 pages uh, and he turned it into a 300 page novel, forget about it, those are gone. When you went from the publisher's book and you took your books back, yeah. did you scan in or use the files from the publisher? In other words, I got you. Uh, whose intellectual property is that after the publisher is invested for the copy of this book for you or something? It all comes back to you. Is that right? So it, it does come back. You better get a, a bulletproof reversion. You need a reversion letter. It's, it's just not a handshake and a smile. Okay? It's got to be a written document. And you've got your lawyer. I've got five lawyers. Um, and yeah, for one thing or another, you know, because it's that kind of world. And they're all specialists. It's like orthopedic surgeons. No, no, I don't do left knees. So. Um, <laughs> 
these lawyers have got to take a look at these verdict letters because your point is pertinent. You need everything back because it's an everything kind of world. Like I touched on holograms and, and you know, video this and, and, uh, and graphic novel, all that. You have to have full, but don't slam the door if you don't get that. Margo and I are engaged with, uh, I guess it's Macmillan or some, anyway, one of the publishers, and we fine-tune one of the lawyers, in fact, that's what he does, is fine-tune contracts. He reads the details, and he found out that traumatic rights in this instance or another could, in fact, be interpreted as applying to an audio product if it's delivered in the separate. Be careful to that, because now we have access we didn't know that we had to exploit the commercial aspects of a book that they certainly, they are not taking advantage of. We can't, because we're fast and nimble and matter and hell, which is a great motivator. So um, that's something you need to pay attention to. Don't give up just because we're going to say, oh, well, no, we're, we're just, you know, not interested. What are you not interested in? We won't publish hard facts. We won't publish paperbacks. We won't do this. We will do that. There's there's wiggle room inside these contracts. That's why they're 32 pages long. There are a lot of holes in those suckers. That's the weird part. Is the obfuscation that you think is ironclad is in fact opened up. It's like Swiss cheese. So it, it's lawyer time well spent. We have discovered that. One question uh, in your new agreement. Did you build in a reversion contract based on a period of unavailability? Uh, yes, to a certain extent. The unavailability is too broad a term. It has to boil down to great specificity. Yeah. Is it money? Is it time? And right. format, of course. But yes, the, they're absolutely early on. For example, the whole ebook thing became kind of creepy because. Ebooks got invented with pre you know, pre existing contracts are already there, you've already signed. Ebooks came about, and the publisher said, Well, you know, reversion is based on uh, print. Is, is it, is it uh, out of print? Well, no, it's not out of print because we have it on the chip. And in fact, just the other day, someone asked for a POD version of your 1988 novel, so therefore it's still in print. That's what agents prompted. Maybe by a few authors said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Time out, guys. There's got to be a credible, you know, threshold." And so now what they've decided is sales, ebook sales, or RFX sales, or paperback sales, whatever it is. And your contract specifies both time and quantity, uh, so that that kind of nonsense no longer exists. But yeah, those things are all written in. They're now a pretty standard world. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I think, uh, are, are you still uh, giving the favorite to promote your product? I mean, is that still? Oh, yeah. Oh, you betcha. You betcha. Yeah. And then the other thing that I think I'm getting from the board uh, that's never going to go out of date is experience. Is that, you know, I mean, I've been in a couple of those situations making things with people that all, all the cards, so to speak, and, I'm standing there wondering if I was going to have a bus here back to me. Yeah. But, uh, and I think that out of it all, I think the best, the best of this experience you know, get out there and do something. Like, you know, and and then I, I'm a writer as well as a publisher. So that, that aspect of it, that's where I find that a lot of my stuff is coming from now, is for me getting out there and being the person that's in front of me. That, I think, goes to the heart of what I was touching on earlier, which was that sense of what it, what does it feel on the inside. We, our, our most precious asset is the, is the life we've led, and the notes we've taken, and the truths that we've recognized to have value. Go there, because otherwise it's a world filled with mirrors and bright lights, and it's easy to be distracted. No. Um, something attractive walks into the room, you go, oh, golly gee, but what's the substance there? And then my second life, no. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. <laughs> uh, it, it, uh, so I think what you're saying is absolutely important. I, yeah, okay, there's a huge debate for the writers in the room. 
Um, is there value to going to bookstores? Well, you could absolutely and quite credibly argue, no, there's absolutely reducing value to going out to bookstores. You have 20 people stand there, yeah, you sign a little stock. Uh, but these people are going to buy your book anyhow. That's why they came to the signing, duh, because they wanted the book they just purchased and signed. However, you've seen how I conducted, quote unquote, this interaction. I immediately went to answers and questions. That's what the touring authors should do, is to open up that arena to back and forth. So what is the author, in fact, doing? The author is utterly self-serving. Yes, he's signing stock and he's meeting his, his readers, but more importantly, he's asking questions. Who are you people? Why do you like my books? Are you cross-chatting? What's going on on the other side of the footlights? That's good data. And you don't find it by sitting in your office uh, doing nothing. Now, if you are sitting in your office, in addition to doing these tours, you better be working the internet. And that's where Margo comes in in, in huge part uh, because she and I and we manage a lot of people who put stuff on the on the internet. Uh, she doesn't like me saying this, but do I tweet? Yeah, I tweet. Do I know personally anything about tweeting? No, I don't. Margo hires someone who tweets in my name. Okay, don't say anything. Oh, she's covering her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> We're business people in this room, okay? So, you know, if you take this out of this room, you're going to die an ugly death. <laughs> I have friends who will see to it. I remember my other jobs. You know? I know when to declare you dead. So, <laughs> and the the point is, is you've got to be practical. Don't take this heartfelt. Don't pay such close attention to your loving mother's advice when you were a child. You know? You got to be a little bit cynical and a little bit practical when it comes to dealing with this world. What do we got? We got tweeting, we got Facebook, we got uh, you know, newsletters, we got emails, we got uh, texting, we, and on and on and on. Do you really want to get up and close and personal with all? Do you want to hold yourself responsible for every workday being filled with this kind of communication? Get a grip. You've got a business to run. <laughs> Farm it out. The recipients of these things are not going to think any less of you because they got an email signed to Archer, love you baby, <laughs> whether Archer wrote it or not. The point was you reached out, you communicated, they felt the love. And they go, oh, that's cool. Hey, come on guys. That is not cynicism, that's practicality. That is going out there and work in the marketplace. You think all these people at Procter and Gamble really care about you, which is why they're selling you their soap? No, it's okay. The final responsibility is with the consumer. Is the product of worth? <coughs> is the integrity palpable? That's what you got to sell. You talked about you know, your continuing relationship with Macmillan doing the new front list hardcover books. Yeah. Uh, and if I heard your comment right, if they stop paying the advances, they you fire them. Right? Or, yeah, you know, in simple language. Yeah. Okay, but don't they do something else too? Like uh, since they're the first edition of every new book, okay, do they maybe? Get it out uh, for reviews and get to stores and things. Maybe a little better than you could yourself. Or less and less so. Less and less. That's the point. We're in a changing world. The question, you know, if you'd asked it last month versus next month, it, there might be a slightly different tilt to the answer. But I think the punchline to it all is that the publishers have been given their opportunity to take advantage and control of this changing world. They failed. If you read magazine article after magazine article, 
in which these publishers are being interviewed, they repeat again and again and again, no one can figure this business out. Okay, okay guys, well, if that's the best you can offer, hey, I can do that. And the point is, the booksellers, the reviewers, the recipients, or I should say the erstwhile recipients of those big players, are becoming more and more broad-minded because their foundation is being eroded. Bookstores now, that's the best play to buy the best place to buy a cooler is at a bookstore or a fuzzy animal or a clutch of balloons. Because bookstores recognize uh, books, yeah, have a latte instead, along with the book. You know? They're not idiots. They understand that they need to do more to attract just the same as they used to attract. Reviewers the same way. Reviewers are looking in this brand new world and going, oh my god, in fact, late breaking news, reviewers are selling themselves now. So if you got a buck fifty, you could buy someone so what a hell of a book, whatever its name was. Okay, so this is this is a strange environment and the, and the Mainline publishers, yes, do they have a current conduit to the New York Times and, and Marilyn Stasio or something if you're Mr. Any, you know, business. Yes, they do have that conduit. Does that mean that that is true forever? Or does that mean, and here is the ultimate sacrilege, does the New York Times really matter anymore? <laughs> Uh-oh. No. The New York Times bestseller list, have you looked at that sucker lately? <laughs> it's got five or six different categories and they run to 35 books each. The left-handed dyslexic children's category now has 35 layers. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so being on the bestseller list, any idiot can be a member of the bestseller list. Look at me. <laughs> It never asks you where you were on the bestseller list. I can legitimately call myself a New York Times bestseller, and I am. I'm not going to tell you where I appeared, <laughs> because I made the New York Times bestseller list. Is it, in fact, if you're going to be mechanically precise about this, is it that important anymore? My answer would be less and less so. Right now, this week, your point is cogent. Next week, a little less so. Week after that, continuing downhill. This is truly, as I pointed out earlier, the Wild West. I mean, we've got a lot of opportunity ahead of us. And it's up to us to be careful in addition of the new old dinosaurs. Okay, and what I mean by that are the Amazons of the world. That's just another standard oil company. These are, are, these are very conservative wannabe or successfully monopolistic enterprises. Be careful about getting into bed with these guys because you might as well go right back to Simon and Schuster. Sir. <laughs> Excellent. Strengthening, strengthening the backs of a lot of these authors and the number of us here in the authors. Yeah. Um, but a lot of the rest of us are small publishers. I'm wondering if you could turn that around give us some advice as to what we can do to compete with the building. What can we offer that is going to really help our authors? I guess it really helps. No, obviously you are how you present yourself, and that, sadly, you've just earned and, and a passage of time. Now, you've been in the game for quite a while, so you got that, but others just starting out, they've got to earn that. And they've got to earn it in a crowd with millions of people. So how do you stand out? How are you that grain of sand on the beach that brings sparkle to you? Well, this is, of course, where we go all the way back to well, how the publishers used to describe the business in the old days. Whoa. <laughs> and there is that aspect to it. But my point was the publishers were happy to just see that as the reality and that was that. My point is, no, I'm sorry, I don't accept that. And in fact, more often than not, if you 
all of a sudden see the pebble that came out of that beach and became a boulder, you will see a lot of hard work behind it, a lot of perseverance. Let's go way back in history to Jacqueline Suzanne, mostly Ooh. because I want to be able to say that name. You know, I mean, who's thought of her lately? But Jacqueline Suzanne was writing books that make Fifty Shades of Grey look like Nobel Prize material. Like I, this was just true on paper. <laughs> but she and her husband got into what was then the brand new event of a, of a, of a mobile home of a, you know, Tilton Hill. And they covered all 50 states. They drove crisscross the United States and they talked with everybody. And by God, we all know who Jacqueline Suzanne is. And it wasn't because of the strength of her writing, it's because of her chutzpah. So she was one of those grains that popped up. Now, okay, so there are those people that just, I don't know why, I keep pounding on Fifty Shades of Grey. I, you know, I don't know, I think about Fifty Shades of Grey, except if it's got really sexy titles. I mean, uh, covers, but uh, and I, I, I've heard about the contents, but that's all I know. But I do know about the phenomenon on a business level. Now, did they put hustle, or she, or he, or whoever wrote the bloody thing, did they put hustle into it? I, I have no idea. It might have just been kismet. My point is, their reality notwithstanding, kismet does exist. And that's where the traditional publishers take them over, you know, take them shelter. They just go, so, well, you know, it happens. We have no way of figuring it out. My point is, okay, yes, it does happen, and in those instances, you have no way of figuring it out. Don't sweat it. There are ways of, of, of affecting influence and of making things matter. So don't get distracted by what you can't do. Focus on what you can do. Figure out a model that works for you, because you're the guy who's stuck with the walls. You're the guy who's got to run the distance. And that's Really, what it boils down to, it, it's kind of like acting, a, asking an actor uh, to fake an accent uh, for the entirety of a play. Usually towards the end of the play, unless that actor is really, really good, you're going to start seeing the Brooklyn creep out. Right? So instead, recognize who you are, what you are, what you want to do, and how you want to do it, and do that. Then people begin to find you. Will it take energy? Oh yeah. Will it take you know this forty-hour work week? I don't know who came up with that, but I sure we don't do that. You're going to have to work a hell of a lot more than that. But you're going to have to also apply that filter. I keep going back to it. Uh, call it the bullshit meter. Whatever it is, if it doesn't feel or smell right, brush it aside. It may be a lost opportunity. There'll be others. There's so much stuff coming down. There's going to be some good stuff. Okay? And meet and talk and compare. It's, are there hard answers? Anyone who gives you a hard answer is reaching for your wallet. Don't believe it. Who else? One last one. Yes, ma'am. Are you handling far and wide sales yourself, or do you go through um, um, like the copyright clearance or, or some other organization that handles that? Depends on the property. The ebooks I do it myself. Um, the uh, hardbacks and such. Or the hardbacks, of course, McMill, uh, my agent does those. Uh, so it depends on again the fine print of the individual contract as to what I've got and how I can exploit it. So, Roughly right, Marvel? Yes. Okay. Can you tell us how many languages that accepted these <laughs> Well, I, I speak in languages in the middle of the night. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to sell a light of uh, it, 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 You know, that's varied over time. I've gone from Polish to Japanese to, to English. <laughs> I don't really spell Arbor and what with the U in there. What the hell is that doing there? Anyhow, I've been translated into British. Uh, French, Italian, German, but nowadays, funnily enough, you don't translate. Nowadays, you publish in English and you sell across the globe. You don't translate. 
too much money involved. Everyone now, they, they just sort of access the stuff in its original language. Uh, and we're getting overseas sales, you know, not in huge numbers, um, but, uh, but it's definitely out there, and it's definitely global, and it's never been translated at all. It just comes out of so it's America, that's what we used to call it. Uh, if you get into the translation game, you're either dealing with such specific, possibly scholarly or technical stuff that it makes sense that you're doing that, or you're Stephen King and what the hell money is no object. But the translation game is prohibitively expensive and it takes forever. So I, I would just say, no, get your overseas rights and just pump it out there because the beauty of this is there's, there's no hardware involved, no books or no warehouse, nothing. Just send it out. Yes? My point to that is just about everyone in Europe speaking this video. Yeah, I mean, they're there. They'll find you. Or, you know, or not, but but uh, we're, we're just making it available. That's where you're going to have to translate over to things like Kobo, which don't really do much in this country, but they do a lot outside this country. And, and that's where we might have to over, overcome our myopia a little to address that. Understand what it is the rest of the world is using and may not be what this this country, funnily enough, when it comes to the electronic and the cutting edge stuff and all that, we're actually way behind on a lot of this stuff, uh, almost provincial. Uh, we're so fat and happy we've lost we've lost sight of the hunger that has stimulated a lot of our um, you know other global residents into uh, really owning a lot of stuff that we haven't even gotten close to. Uh, so if you want to sell that market, you better pay attention to how they're doing it. Uh, I'm out of here. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.